In this video, you're going to learn how to order fully assembled functional PCB boards. And I'm going to be going in depth into all the various technical specifications that you need to know when ordering boards. We're going to be looking at two of the most popular PCB manufacturers, PCBWay and JLC PCB. But really, any PCB manufacturer is going to have very similar options. So, what you're going to learn in this video can be applied to any manufacturer. Okay, let's get started. On the homepage, they have an instant quote feature, and this just allows you to order bare boards using all of the default settings. And you just need to enter the dimensions. So let's say 50 by 50, then choose the quantity. We'll do five, and then how many routing layers and the thickness of the board. And as soon as you click the quote now button, it's gonna take you to a page where it gives you the full quote, but you can see there's all these options here and they just went with the default. And and they didn't include any PCB assembly. So I'm gonna to explain to you all of these various options because in many cases, you won't wanna go with the defaults that they've selected for you. Now, as far as the files that you're upload, which I covered in the previous video, keep in mind that PCB Way doesn't actually ask for these files until you finish this page. Um, it's on the next step where they ask for the files, whereas JLC PCB asks you to upload the files on the very first step. The first question they're asking you is the board Board type. Keep in mind that when printed circuit boards are manufactured, they're not done in most cases individually, one board at a time. Instead, they are produced in larger panels that contain multiple copies of the same board. And this is done because it just allows a much more efficient manufacturing process than having lots of tiny boards or lots of variation in the board size going through the manufacturing process. Then the panel of boards is broken up or depanelized into your individual boards. You can either order single pieces, and that just means that PCB Way takes care of all the issues with panels and depanelization. Then you have the number of different designs in the panel. The simplest case is if your product just requires one printed circuit board, then you're gonna have a panel that has 10 copies of the exact same board. But you do have the option, if your product requires two different printed circuit boards, then you could combine those together in the same panel. So you're basically manufacturing both boards at the same time. Then you're going to select the size of your board. I'm just gonna do 50 millimeters by 50 millimeters. That's a board that's about two inches by two. Then you enter the quantity. You have to they have different presets. The minimum that they allow is five boards. On your very first design version, I would recommend that you order five boards. Next, we have the number of layers. So this is the number of routing layers. Most boards are gonna have a minimum of two beyond two layers, then it has to be an even number of layers. There's only even number of layers. You can't have an odd number of layers. But PCBWay does give you the option of doing a single layer board, which I've never had a design that only needed one layer. In most cases, you're gonna need at least two layers. Keep that in mind. Next, we have the material. And this is the core material for the printed circuit board. It will be the material that will be used that will be between each of the routing layers. And FR4 is by far the most common base material for a printed circuit board. And the FR just stands for flame retardant. This is a, a flame retardant material, and that's gonna be sufficient for most designs. The exceptions are, if you're using a wireless module that has a built-in antenna, then this isn't a concern. But if you have either a fully custom RF circuit, or perhaps you're using a module and then you have a feed line going to an antenna that's on your own board, then you're gonna wanna use a more specialized base material that has more tightly controlled RF characteristics, such as the dielectric constant of the material. And you can see here, if I go from FR4 to Rogers, then it gives you two different options, and they are both very similar. The only difference is that the 4350B is more environmentally friendly because it's a halogen-free material versus the Rogers 4003C. So I would definitely go with the Rogers 4350B as your choice if your design has custom RF circuitry in it. The other options that you'll see are we have an aluminum and a copper base. And the main reason for using a metal core is to improve the heat transfer, the power dissipation capabilities of the design. 
One thing I forgot to mention is with FR4, you'll see there are different TG grades. And what this TG is the stands for, it's a glass transition temperature. It's the temperature at which the material goes from a solid, rigid structure to more of a rubbery substance. You want to make sure that you stay below the glass transition temperature. If you're new to PCB design, then I highly suggest that you watch my full length tutorial on how to design your first PCB. And you can access this full tutorial at predictabledesigns.com slash first PCB. Next, we have the thickness of the board itself. And this is the entire board. This includes the routing layers and the dielectric base material. By far the most common, if you're just gonna generate a PCB and the thickness isn't really critical for your need, then I would just go with a 1.6. If it's an exceptionally small product where you need it to be as thin as possible or as light as possible, then that's the case where you may go to a lower thickness. Or if you need a, an exceptionally strong board or a board that's really large so it can flex and easily break, then you would want to go with a thicker board. Next, we have the minimum track and spacing. The minimum width that a trace can be and is then also the same as the minimum spacing between those traces. A six mils, a mil is a thousandth of an inch, a six mil minimum trace with a six mil minimum spacing distance is pretty much the most standard. If space isn't super critical for your design, then that's the one I would go with. And then if small size for your board is that becomes more critical, then you're gonna want to step down to the smaller trace and spacing. Then we have the minimum hole size. This is going to be the minimum diameter of a hole that can be drilled. And the most common hole that you'll be drilling in a print circuit board are for vias. A via is a hole that's got copper in it and allows you to connect a trace between the different layers. Next, we have the solder mask. And a solder mask is a protective layer that is added to the outer layers of a board to prevent oxidation of the copper and to prevent solder bridges. This is all copper that's on the outer layers that's not being soldered to. This is not for the pads, the SMT pads, for instance, but this is the, we cover up any traces and it prevents oxidation. And this is classically a green color. That's by far the most common color for a solder mask. That's why most boards that you're probably used to seeing are green. But PCB Way and most PCB shops will give you alternative colors that you can choose from. Then we have the silk screen. And the silk screen is a layer for adding text and simple images, say, for instance, a logo or the outline of where the capacitor should be placed. So it's just text and simple images that are on your top and or your bottom layer of your board. And the most common thing that you'll see silk screen is for adding the different component designators, R22 for a resistor or C12 for a capacitor or U1 for a chip of some sort. If your board has edge connectors, then here you're gonna wanna select yes and you'll be able to specify the surface finish for those edge connectors since abrasion resistance and good electrical contact is critical for edge connectors and hard gold is going to be the most common option here. Next we have the surface finish and the surface finish is a coating that's added to exposed copper pads on the outer layers of the board to prevent corrosion and improve solderability. H-A-S-L hassle has in the past been the most common option and for the longest time it had lead in it obviously we've gotten where we're trying to get lead out of the electronic products and out of the environment and need to have lead free if you're going to meet rohs certification requirements most designs i would just go with the immersion gold that's by far the most common today Immersion silver is another lead-free option that can be used. Next, we have the VIA process. Normally, a VIA is going to be left open after processing, but there are some cases where you do not want that VIA to be exposed because, for instance, solder can be wicked down into the hole and such. There's two different options for covering up or filling in these open VIAs, and the first is just called tenting VIA, and there's no extra cost for this. There's really no extra step. It's basically you design your Gerber files so that the solder mass 
mask layer goes over and covers up the via holes. And this is primarily going to work for a really small diameter via holes because solder mask wasn't really designed specifically for plugging a via. If the via hole diameter is too large, then you probably won't get a consistent guaranteed uniform coverage of that via. And tinting, even though for most vias it's going to work, especially smaller vias, it's not as guaranteed a process of covering up that via or plugging that via. And in those cases, if you need a plug via, then you would select this here and that's going to add some extra cost. Next we have the finished copper. This is in ounces, but it's really a measure of the, how thick your copper is. The weight is just the weight of a copper layer that's spread over one square foot. For instance, if you spread one ounce of copper over one square foot, then that's going to give you a thickness of 1.4 mils. And thicker copper traces are primarily used if you have high current traces then you're going to want to use a thicker copper. That makes it where you don't have to have that trace quite as wide. There are also some advanced options that you can see here, and most of these are pretty rare. And if you're advanced enough to need them, then you're probably going to understand which of these you need to select. So I'm not going to go through these advanced options. Now we're going to look at the specifications for the PCB assembly, which is the process of having all the components soldered onto the printed circuit board. PCB Way gives you three options for the assembly. There is turnkey, kitted or consigned, and then a combo. Turnkey is basically they source all of the components. You give them the BOM and through their vendors, they supply the, all the different component parts. A kitted or consigned is if the, you supply them all the parts. You would take care of ordering all the components and shipping it to them for the assembly process. And then they also offer a combo, which is a combination of the two. So you can maybe supply, for instance, if maybe there's a couple of special parts that are difficult to source that you've got a special vendor for, then you may want to supply those and then let PCB Way supply all of the other parts. So you can choose between those different options. Then you can do, once again, you can do a board type. You can either do a single piece, like we've discussed before, or a panelized PCB. And they tell you that if your quantity is above 20 pieces or any side of the board is less than 50 millimeters, then it's best to do a panelized PCB. So this just means the assembly process will be done on the entire panel at one time instead of on each board separately. Because if you have a high number of boards or you have really small boards and it really doesn't make sense, to do those on a single piece basis. But for this, we'll just we'll leave it as a single piece. Then we have an assembly. You can either put components either on the top side, bottom side, or both sides. For most designs that need to be moderately compact, you're going to want components placed on the top and bottom side. But if space isn't as critical for you, then it will keep your costs lower if you only have components placed on the top side or just one single side. And once again, we have the number boards that you're going to have assembled. If your board has any components that are especially sensitive, then you can highlight that here. And then if you're okay with component substitutes made in China, well, then you would select that here. Number of unique parts. And the keyword is unique. For example, if your board uses five identical capacitors in various parts in the design, then that just counts as one unique component. And commonly, you will also see this referred to as BOM lines, because in a BOM, every unique component gets its own line. If you have five identical capacitors, those are just one BOM line, but with a quantity of five. And this just tells them how many different components they have to manage and to program for the assembly process. This is going to obviously impact the price of the PCB assembly. The next, they asked for the number of SND parts, and an SND is a surface mount device. Now, keep in mind that most of the other vendors I've seen tend to ask for the number of SND pads and not just the number of SND parts. So be sure you pay close attention to this one, depending on which vendor you use for ordering boards. Also, these are not unique parts. So if you have five SMD capacitors and they're all identical, then you're going to count each one of those separately. Then next, they ask for the number of parts or chips that are in a BGA, a QFP, or a QFN package. And then they also have the number of through-hole parts, which I've just described, are very not very common anymore. 
There's some other options here. The first option here is to depanel all the boards to delivery. Whether or not you want individual boards shipped to you that have already been depaneled or broken apart, or if you instead want them to ship you the full panels that aren't split up yet. Then we have a conformal coating, and a conformal coating is a protective layer that can be added to the printed circuit board after assembly, and it's commonly used to just protect all of the electronic components if it's used in, say, a high humidity or an environment with a lot of contaminants. Functional testing is used to make sure that you don't have any short circuits or bad solder connections or missing components. It's a functional test of the board to make sure that the assembly process and the fabrication process went through without any major problems. They even offer the option of you can have them load your firmware and then they have x-ray testing can be used for looking for bad solder connections, let's say on a BGA package where all the solder connections or even a lead list package where all the solder connections connections are underneath the part and they can't be visibly inspected. The only way to inspect them is with x-ray. In case you missed it, here's the first part of this tutorial where I show you how to output all of the necessary manufacturing files using KiCad. So be sure you check that out next.